This is tape four on February 8th, 1998 with Mr. Jacob Ehrlich. Mr. Ehrlich, please continue. Uh, we uh, survived our stay in Taposco in a very strange manner. Um, my mother actually, I'm saying survived as, uh, from the point of view, what did we eat? Remember that this was um, an area that was uh, surrounded by the Germans, and whatever food there was, we were totally at the mercy of uh, the villagers uh, around us, and whatever they would want to give us. Um, uh, we didn't have much to trade, didn't have any belongings, but um, uh, one of the ways uh, we did survive was that my mother, who has learned this um, fortune-telling um, from, uh, I'm sure it goes, it, it, it dates back from, for, for a long, long time, because uh, a Turkish woman who used to tell her, uh, I guess, my mom when she was young, uh, maybe as we were all interested in knowing what the future will bring, maybe she had her fortune told by that uh, old woman, and she kind of uh, learned, she asked her, she, uh, she, uh, she's, my mother told me later, I said, Mom, how did you learn this? Uh, it was uh, uh, done with, uh, unlike some fortune tellers can see your fortune in the cards or see it in uh, coffee, you know, uh, or palm of your hand. This is done with beans, 41 beans, which is spread in three, in three piles and uh, depending on what is, it's separated by four, by four beans, and whatever is left, for example, in a group, if there's uh, seven, eight beans, you separate four, and, and then three is left, it goes, it, it goes in, a, in, a, in a line of three, three, uh, three vertically, three horizontally, and three vertically. And it, you have to know how to read it. I have learned how to do it also. Um, Amazing, amazing things. I mean, uh, I'm not uh, <laughs> superstitious, <laughs> but this actually uh, made us survive for almost a year and a half of, we ate well, let me put it this way. Um, villagers would come to my mom and everyone had, during the war of course, some members who were in the army, on, or maybe some um, uh, uh, romantic, uh, you know, uh, curiosities and so forth. And um, uh, the, the, the villagers uh, were so amazed with my uh, mom's uh, capability that uh, sometimes she had a choice. So they want eggs <laughs> or cornmeal, and the most was salt. You couldn't get salt. Salt was like gold because none they couldn't get it in. They needed it for their cattle and we needed it for our food. So uh, to get that is because my mother did, did a good job. Um, the word got around, uh, especially because of a case where this young girl came to my mom and my mom didn't like what she saw in that. She didn't even want to tell her. Uh, my mother did tell her to take care of herself. Something bad might happen. She was killed the following day. She was killed while bringing food to the lines of, you know, battle, battle lines. And the word got around that my mother warned her. Now, the commander of these partisans there, they thought he was some kind of a fraud, or, you know, and he came over to, to have his fortune, incognito, of course, and say who he was. He, was. he wasn't even dressed as a soldier, you know. Came in civilian clothes to have his fortune told. And my mother told him exactly uh, what, how many times he was wounded. <laughs> told him that he was, he had a, a very, he has a job of high responsibility. When, when they were through, he says, my lady, I, I must admit that I came here very suspicious, but what you told me is unbelievable. And he identified himself, himself and uh, said who he was. 
and let her continue doing what she was doing. You know. Um, that's how we survived as far as I remember. This is an interesting thing. There was this suitcase. There was, I had a little suitcase. It was filled to the top with cornmeal. Every day it was cornmeal and because there was no salt. <laughs> My mother used to make it. She used to boil it. She used to uh, fry it. There was no oil. <laughs> she couldn't fry it. Sometimes a little lard or maybe um, you know, she would improvise something, but it was called polenta. Polenta was, uh, was cornmeal. That's all it was, and eggs. It was a yellow layer of, of cornmeal with all the eggs, <laughs> white eggs scattered all over, you know. So I always remember the suitcase with eggs. What a way to keep them so they won't break. Um, we were attacked seldom by, um, oh, I must, I must say this is an important thing. When this, uh, when, when, when this old woman came to my mother to have her fortune told, she told her, they told me, you know, uh, they told me you were Jewish. My mom said, yes, we're Jews. And she keeps looking at her and she says, but you know, you're beautiful. What do you mean, my mom says? No, because they told us that the Jews were ugly people. Maybe in a sense, you know, of, of describing like, like, uh, you know, ugly, ugly maybe, maybe with a long nose, you know, a lot of those caricatures uh, which they portray us as, they told us that, that the Jews were ugly people. Can you imagine at that time, we're talking here the year uh, 1940, and these villagers still thought the Jews uh, Look at the power that, that God knows where, whether it's um, fallacy or whoever told her, you know, that was, that was already anti-Semitism and so forth. And um, she left very happily that she has met a, a good-looking Jew. We stayed at this little house um, that uh, our friend, uh, the shoemaker, provided us with. And I remember once a sign which was usually um, to, 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 uh, to uh, 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 warn people that an aircraft was approaching, uh, was a one rifle shot. And everybody knew that the aircraft was approaching. After the rifle shot, we heard soon after this German plane, Stuka, they had an eerie sound when they would dive, and um, uh, they indiscriminately just opened fire, whatever was moving. And I remember uh, looking through the window, and I could see that plane up in the sky coming right towards our house. It was diving, and um, you could hear that, 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 uh, and you know, and, and we just, why did he dive? Because he saw, he saw a soldier crossing the street and running towards our house. And then the plane, we didn't know whether he's going to bomb or it's just machine gun. He opened fire with the machine gun. And um, I remember we all fell into the ground. And I could hear my mom say, Shema Israel, Shema Israel. And I repeated the same thing on the floor. Everybody was on the floor. And then a few seconds later, we realized uh, we heard a machine gun fire. And we realized he didn't, he probably ran out of bombs, you know. The plane left and we went outside. The tree, the tree in the back of the house bullets maybe like two and a half inches long just this, this powerful machine guns you know that they had it, it, it just it was embedded in the tree i tried to get it out and <laughs> i wasn't able to but um that's what they did that they they did indiscriminately they they made themselves being hated they just uh did harm um maybe in a way that's what prevented them from winning the war because they wasted so much 
on insignificant things, you know. But that was a very scary time. Terrible. You know, like when you know you're gonna die. If there was a small house, if this had been a bomb, nobody would have survived. You know. That's one of the things. And each time you would go out in the street, you hear the a rifle shot. Oh, once I heard it, I was, uh, I didn't know where to run. And I saw the planes coming. And I just dove into the ditch. You know. Once, there was a sharpshooter in one of the villages, nearby villages. When the plane was flying very low, he shot at the plane. He, um, hit, I don't know whether the propeller or the pilot, and the plane crashed. The uh, pilot survived. I haven't seen it, but that's what I was told. The pilot survived because he did so much, because he killed so many people. They hung him in the middle of the square, immediately. The Germans found out. He was, he, he was left there for two days. Who hung him? The partisans, the partisan hung that, or the villagers, whoever, you know, they, this, you know, this is a, a the spur of the moment, you know, this is vengeance. And then and, and, and Yugoslavians are known to react very quickly to that. And I can't blame, you know, uh, the vengeance was the name of the game. They left him hanging there for two days. The Germans found out, and they raised the village. They destroyed the village completely. That's how, that's how brutal they were. So, a Topusko uh, left Topusko again in a very, very strange way. Uh, the partisan made contact with uh, the Allied forces in Italy uh, because of the wounded soldiers and so forth. Um, the Allied planes would land on open fields which was lit by bonfire and that signaled to them that um, they're friendly you know it signaled to the planes and I don't know what kind of communication they had from from the planes uh, and the ground uh, they would land there about 12 o'clock 1 o'clock in the morning 10 planes every night every night we used to hear that uh, sound you know and word got around that they are bringing medic medicine and they are taking wounded the wounded people to Italy to Bari so my mother inquired and uh, again because they were afraid that the Germans the fact that we were surrounded and the Russians were advancing on the Eastern Front they were they were almost sure that that this res packet of resistance would, would be overcome by um, uh, the Germans. They uh, started transporting women and children to Italy. And my mother uh, asked permission if, if she could take us, and she was granted that permission. So one one evening, uh, the sad the sad part of it that uh, my uh, my aunt was with me with my with with uh, uh, with my cousin. Um, uh, her name was Fanica, and um, uh, my my cousin's name was Beto. Her husband, my uncle, was. Um, dentist and he was taken prisoner by the Germans he was in a concentration camp but by some miracle he worked as a dentist he was a very good dentist he worked for a German officer another dentist in medical field in other words he saved him he survived the concentration camp and later on uh, he was reunited uh, with my aunt and my aunt and my, and my cousin she Can did not leave uh, uh, my my aunt lived with us in that little 
house. I forgot to mention that. But she didn't want to leave. She didn't want to leave because she says, I want to wait for my husband. So she was left behind, you know, and we didn't know what was going to happen. That hurt me very much, you know. We went to this field, one o'clock in the morning. Just before you yes. continue, do you know the camp that your uncle was in? Uh, no. No. I, I don't know the camp. But I know that he uh, survived uh, because of this German commander or officer who employed him as his personal assistant. Uh, Did your aunt survive waiting for her? Yes. Yes. It was a very happy news. And they, then they immigrated to Israel. Yes. Uh, one of the reasons I like to go back to Israel to, to see my, my cousin, my aunt died. So did my uncle. But my cousin and I got along very nicely. I'm very embarrassed to say that I should have done it much, much before. Um, we were in um, 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 I'm, just, I'm trying to think. Um, yes. We approached the plane. We could see the plane circling. We could hear the plane circling. Finally, this beautiful metal bird. <laughs> That's why my, my, my admiration for, for, for aviation started. I said, this is, this is the bird that's going to take us to, to, for the first time, you know. I must tell you something, that each, each day that we would go to sleep, each night when we go to sleep, uh, the question in my mind was always, are we, are we going to survive this? Will I ever see freedom? Will I ever be able to wake up one morning and say, I'm not afraid that somebody is going to kill us or pers persecute us, you know? And when I saw that plane, I said, how marvelous it must be to be taken away somewhere where you wake up in the morning and you know that nothing is going to happen to you, that you're going to live, that you are going to live. Because to, to me, it was like, a, uh, I was like saying, you know, everything, all the plans that were made for the future was if we survive, if you survive. Many nights we would go to sleep with all dressed up with shoes and everything. We wouldn't take them because you don't know. It happened during the night we had to run, that we had to leave, get up and, and go into the woods because you didn't know. So um, when they started taking the wounded on the plane, it was a twin engine plane. Uh, there was there was an uh, English plane, English plane. I saw uh, these uh, pilots, you know, the boys trying running, and it was done very, very fast. It was done quickly, and the children stacked in. These were planes where you had uh, military planes. Of course, uh, the seats were always on the side, benches underneath. You know, you could put your belongings underneath the benches. I'm stating that because it played an important role in my father being saved. This place under the bench was when my father approached the plane to kiss my mother goodbye and us. It was so dark. There was only one step to the plane. So my mother tell, told me that. She says, I told Dad, why don't you come in? Why don't you step out? And my father looked around and, without much thought, jumped in. They were looking, where is he going to sit? He crawled under the bench. And my mother took a few children that were there, myself and my, and my, my sister, and put us over this bench, sitting like covering. And then came the, they, then, then came someone to count how many people were on the plane with a flashlight. And just take chances in life and you will survive. Remember what I told you? Pasa un punto y verás un mundo. 
go over a little problem and you'll live forever? Well, that's what it was, calculated risk. He did go over it. They never saw him. The plane took over. The, the plane took off. I was sitting. I was sitting near the door. The door was open. The door was open. I was trapped. And I remember looking down and see little lights disappear. And so did all the problems of being captive and, and fear and everything else. We arrived. It was still dark. Two hours. In body. The plane landed. We got out. And then they brought us something that I thought <laughs> was <laughs> that yellow polenta bread or whatever. I said, why did they wrap it in paper? It was white bread. <laughs> We haven't seen it for two and a half years, three years, God knows when. White, white bread, we never, we never saw. And uh, that was our trip to, uh, to safety. We came um, and found out there were many other Jews from all over Yugoslavia that were there, 1,500 of them, in a camp near Bari. And what was the name of the camp? The camp was called uh, um, um, Palese. Palese. It was near Bari. Before we continue with this camp, I'd like to just go back one moment. Um, you said that you sometimes had to go to sleep with your clothes yes. and shoes on. Yes, yes. Could you just... Slept on the floor. There were no beds. No beds. We slept on the floor. We just had to be dressed to, to, to run away. Could you describe an, an occasion where you had to run out? Yes. Uh, they, would, uh, they, would, uh, they would signal to you when you had to run and run fast. Either they would bang at your door, or you could, you know, uh, it was a small town. And uh, the, the fear was that we would be uh, swept by, by, by motorized force. We were right near the road. And you just had to be very, very fast. Since we didn't have any belongings with us, it was very, very easy to move. I, I remember going and sleeping. One night we slept in the woods. Um, and we heard, a, we, we, we heard a, it was mortar, mortar fire. It was flying all over us. Oh, it was just a tremendous, uh, you know, must have been a big fight. We could, we could hear the whistling of the... Of the uh, of the grenades and the, and, and, and the mortar fire all over from, from one side to another. Very, very... Uh, you know, we just didn't know where to go, what to do. Uh, many a times, uh, you know, the enemy would miss us by, by a little bit, you know, because uh, when you are surrounded, where are you going to run? That was the resistance offered, uh, and maybe that's that's why we we survived that. Yeah. But I remember distinctly, uh, there were every night. If I survived, that was if I survived would be so nice. And I remember I wanted so much to have something to to write paper and pencils and so forth. Oh, once I came across a pencil and a piece of paper, that was a joy. Oh, none, we had nothing. Oh, gee, we had nothing. So, um, uh, scary moments, yes. Uh, that was part of our odyssey as far as escaping from uh, the enemy, uh, coming to Italy and not knowing what to do, where to go. Uh, they, they sent us this time uh, from that camp. We went to the uh, southern part of Italy, which was uh, Lecce. Uh, Lecce was the main town, but we were further down, which was called um, Santa Croce. Santa Croce was um, the the refugees were placed in homes of uh, 
that was confiscated from the fascists, Italian fascists. Some of them were like palaces, some of them were family homes, uh, but all beautiful homes. No furniture had nothing in it, some of them did. We were placed, each family would get a room. We were placed in there awaiting immigration, whether it's to Israel or the States or, or going back to Yugoslavia. We, we were staying in one room, which was a beautiful, beautiful, my beautiful, it was like a very, very beautiful palace with orchards. Uh, I mean, can you imagine what it did to me uh, and, 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 the, and our family uh, living in a place like this? No luxury there. I mean, <laughs> we had a bed, yes. Um, uh, the, we were given uh, food, was provided by uh, UNRWA. That's United Nations Refugee um, Organization, and by Joint, um, and by IRO. Uh, but Joint was helped us a lot. Do you remember what time this was? Yes, 1940, uh, 1944. Yeah, the war didn't end yet. 1944. Uh, uh, remember seeing. Um, American forces and English pilots. That's why I started learning English. <laughs> but, Could you uh, describe yes. the first time you saw an American? Yes, yeah. Uh, again, we lived near a rest camp, and every day, every night, there was music. <laughs> and music is like magnet to me. <laughs> I would go and listen to the jazz singing also and they were both American and English it was my understanding that they didn't like each other <laughs> too much <laughs> as later on I'll describe <laughs> but I would go there and listen to it and, and, and I like I liked the words and I started learning started uh, actually uh, my dad uh, couldn't get hold of a dictionary but he copied one <laughs> for me <laughs> and I would learn 10 words 10 English words a day I'm self-taught in English. Uh, I knew English before I came to the States. Uh, just loved it. Loved the music, like everything about it. Remember the first time I saw the ad for Coca-Cola? Oh, this must be a delicious drink, I tell to myself. And what does it taste like? <laughs> it was in all those magazines that I used to see a Coca-Cola. You know, I saw the bottle. <laughs> so. Much later on did I try it. Yeah, it was good and it's still one of my favorites. <laughs> I'm not discriminating against Pepsi. <laughs> the thing is, it brings memory of Coke. Maybe that's why I like Coke the best, because it brings me memory. I'm associating it when I first saw it. It's very interesting how certain things, you say Coke, what does it, what does it say? Um, in, uh, in this particular place, um, uh, the, the, the description of this is uh, Santa Croce was Surrounded by vineyards, there was a kind of rocky beach. Again, loved the water. Summers were beautiful. Um, the garden was all fruits, <laughs> so good to help yourself. <laughs> it was so, this probably one of the, it's probably like a reward for all the sufferings that we went through, you know. So here we were getting uh, free clothing. We were getting uh, free food. But again, my father wanted to do something. And uh, what he did, in order to have a few dollars, to have some money for expenses, uh, he would go to town and he would buy some fruits and some Italian bread and mortadella, salami, and so forth, and made sandwiches and put a few tables outside and um, he used to sell them. We're going to have to change tapes again. <laughs>